Hello everyone, I'm Shikha Laloria, Professor of Biochemistry at IAC. Today is the introductory lecture to the course on cell biology, cellular organization, division and processes. I'll be introducing you to the basics of cell components and organization and I'll be giving a general overview of the macromolecules that compose the cell of membranes, uh, organelles and the processes that occur within the cell. So why should we study cell biology? All organisms are made up of cells. Focusing on the cell is a starting point to get a detailed understanding of the organism as a whole. And cell biology is a fundamental discipline in life sciences and in biomedical research. In order to understand the disease state of a cell or an organism, one must first understand normal cell function. So what is cell biology? Yeah, this discipline is the study of cells, which is the basic unit of life that all organisms are made up of. Uh, we study the structure of cells, the molecules, the compartments within the cell and their organization. Uh, the function that is the cellular energetics and metabolism, the decoding and release of genetic information in the form of newly synthesized mo molecules, um, and uh, also the division of the cell, that is reproduction of the cell, replication and segregation of the genetic material, and its regulation. And also we study intercellular communication, both intra as well as intracellular signaling. So uh, in this lecture, as I mentioned, I'll be uh, talking in the first part uh, about the composition of cells, various, various molecules, uh, small molecules as well as macromolecules, and certain definitions of cells and different types of cells uh, that uh, we study, and model systems. A little bit about uh, introduction uh, to ATP as well. So a cell is a basic unit of life. Uh, cells were first seen um, in sections of cork by Robert Hooke a long time ago. Around the same time, uh, Leeuwen Hooke saw living cells using a simple microscope. And uh, he also saw some microbes moving around in pond water. And therefore, he referred to them as small animals or animalcules, which is just a translation of the Dutch word that he used for it. And he also observed uh, many other types of cells in muscles, sperm, RBC, etc. Uh, Schleiden and Schwann uh, were uh, biologists, a botanist and a physiologist who were studying plants and animals respectively. And uh, they uh, define cells as elementary particles of organisms in both plants and animals. And uh, from their observations, they concluded that some organisms are unicellular, whereas others are multicellular. Um, the cell theory was proposed uh, by Schwann. Um, and uh, of course, synthesizing both of their observations. And it was stated that the cell is the unit of structure, physiology, and organization in living things. A cell can either have a distinct identity or it can be a building block in the construction of multicellular organisms. And somewhat erroneously, it was stated that cells form by free cell formation, similar to formation of crystals or by spontaneous generation, which we now know is not true. And hence a collection of this uh, came about uh, by uh, Fierko, who was a pathologist who proposed that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Uh, Fleming, uh, who's an anatomist, described the process of cell division. And uh, he observed that cell reproduction involves transmission of chromosomes from parent to daughter cells by mitosis, followed by the division of the cell uh, into two cells. So as per the current cell theory, the cell is the fundamental structural and functional unit of living beings. All organisms are made up of one or more cells. Cells arise from pre-existing cells by cell division. 
Cells carry hereditary information that is passed on to daughter cells during cell division. And uh, all cells have more or less similar chemical composition and structural organization with a few small differences that we'll discuss in this class. And uh, there are various uh, reactions that occur inside cells that require energy. And this uh, involves energy flow uh, among the molecules present within the cells. So the basic components of any cell are mainly three, the genetic material or the DNA uh, and the cytoplasm. Um, and uh, these contents, they are surrounded by the plasma membrane. So this is the very basic and they are simple cells uh, known as prokaryotes, which have uh, only these and they don't have any uh, intracellular membranes. Some cells, however, also have a cell wall, uh, such as fungi or plant cells. And uh, then there are other cells uh, known as eukaryotes, in which the genetic material is enclosed in a compartment known as the nucleus, which is a membrane bound compartment. So you have prokaryotes, an example of which is E. coli bacterium and eukaryotes, two different kinds are shown here. The budding is Saccharomyces cerevisiae and an animal cell, which is much larger than the other two. So uh, this slide summarizes some of the properties of prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are almost always unicellular, and uh, whereas eukaryotes can be unicellular or multicellular, uh, prokaryotes are rather small, ranging from 0.2 microns to about 2 microns in diameter. Uh, and these are all general rules. They have a nucleoid. Uh, there's no nuclear membrane. The DNA is usually circular. And uh, this is surrounded by cytoplasm, which has ribosomes. Uh, mitochondria are absent. Centrosomes are absent. And examples of this class are eubacteria and archaebacteria. Eukaryotes are uh, somewhat slightly larger cells. They can range in size approximately from 10 microns to even 100 microns. Of course, some cells are much larger. Um, and um, they have a nucleus, which is a membrane bound compartment that has the DNA. The DNA is often uh, linear, organized in chromosomes. And uh, the cytoplasm has got ribosomes and several membrane bound organelles such as the endoplasmic reticulum, lysosomes, Golgi apparatus, peroxisomes, etc. Mitochondria are present and they produce ATP and uh, they also have uh, centrosomes generally. So examples of eukaryotes are animals, plants, yeasts or fungi and uh, protists or protozoa. So uh, prokaryotes, as I already mentioned, don't have a nucleus. Uh, they have genetic material and it's uh, kind of uh, known as a nucleoid attached to the cell membrane. And they include archaea and various kinds of bacteria, some of which are shown here. Uh, one of them is E. coli which I'm mentioning because it's a very popular model organism in cell biology and molecular biology research. There are two types of bacteria based on their staining properties, gram negative or gram positive, which refers to their uh, staining by crystal violet, where the gram negative give a light pink color, whereas the gram positive ones are stained uh, purple uh, because they have the gram positive uh, bacteria have a thick peptidoglycan layer shown here and no outer membrane. Whereas gram negative bacteria have a very thin peptidoglycan layer and they also have an uh, outer lipid membrane. Another class of interesting bacteria are cyanobacteria, uh, which are photosynthetic bacteria. Uh, they uh, have thylakoid membranes and also the enzyme Rubisco, which fixes atmospheric CO2. Coming to the origin of eukaryotes, 
it is believed that they arose from a predatory cell such as an archaea derived anaerobic ancestor that engulfed an aerobic eubacterium that later on evolved into a mitochondria another similar event uh, that happened was the acquisition of cyanobacteria from this derived cell uh, to finally uh, produce plant cells the cyanobacteria may have evolved into chloroplasts found in current day plant cells the nuclear genome in eukaryotes uh, is derived both from the archaeobacterial as well as the eubacterial genomes this slide shows the diversity of eukaryotes as mentioned eukaryotes can be either uni or multicellular shown at the top are various unicellular eukaryotes such as yeast a model system in cell and molecular biology research the green alga chlamydomonas and a protist paramecium a transition to multicellularity occurred early on shown at the bottom is the alga volvox which has got uh 16 germ cells and about 2000 somatic cells various organisms have been used for research in cell biology starting with the bacterium e coli the yeast uh, budding yeast as well as fission yeast and uh, various other multicellular organisms uh, such as c elegans drosophila uh, frogs zebra fish uh, human cell lines mice and so on and also uh, arabidopsis which is a model plant uh, organism uh, the model organism is chosen based on its suitability for the question being asked so living systems only have a subset of elements for example in the human body of course the major comp composition the major molecule present is water but among the elements uh, the most common elements are carbon hydrogen nitrogen oxygen and often these are linked by covalent bonds to form molecules and there are other elements in smaller quantities uh, such as uh, ions uh, sodium potassium magnesium calcium and so on and various trace elements which are present in very small quantities as i already mentioned water uh, is the major constituent uh, of cells about 70% and water molecules they form a hydrogen bonded network because of uh, its um, being a dipole and we'll come to this um, in the next slide uh, cells also have various kinds of small as well as large organic molecules small molecules such as sugars fatty acids amino acids nucleotides which uh, make up the macromolecules which are larger polysaccharides lipids or come together to form membranes uh, proteins and nucleic acids and also various kinds of ions uh, inside the cell the molecules bind to each other by non covalent bonds uh, such as electrostatic bonds hydrogen bonds van der waals interactions and also very importantly hydrophobic force in water it pushes nonpolar groups uh, away from the hydrogen bonded water network so just to recap uh, about the structure of atoms atoms of course they're the smallest particle that retain the properties uh, of an element Uh, each atom has at its center a positively charged nucleus which has got positively charged protons and neutral neutrons and the nucleus is surrounded by a cloud of electrons electrons are negatively charged an atom overall is neutral so the number of protons and electrons are equal and um This is a highly schematic representation. I mean, you cannot have uh, be sure about the positions of the electrons uh, as is depicted here. But uh, in fact, the the properties of these subatomic particles are described by quantum mechanics, which we will not be covering in this course. Uh, but most importantly, it's important to know that. 
the electrons determine the chemical behavior uh, of an atom in terms of the types of bonds it forms or interacts with other atoms. Uh, once again, this is a highly schematic representation of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, their atomic numbers and weights are shown. And in fact, the nucleus is much, much smaller than what is shown here in relation to the electron cloud. Now, electrons, they can only exist in a certain discrete states called orbitals, and each can accommodate only a certain number of electrons. For example, the innermost shell uh, can have only two electrons. Uh, the second can have up to eight electrons as well as the third and so on. Uh, an unfilled electron shell is less stable than a filled one. And hence, uh, when there's an incomplete shell, uh, then this atom it tries to complete this shell by taking up uh, sh uh, electrons or sharing electrons. And uh, this number of electrons is termed as the valence. Now, uh, a carbon atom, for example, it has it can share four electrons, um, and uh, uh, therefore it can form four bonds with other molecules, which have tetrahedral symmetry, as shown here in case of methane. When an atom forms covalent bonds with other atoms. Uh, these bonds, they have a defined orientation in space relative to one another. And uh, these reflect the orientations of the orbits of the shared electrons. Um, so the uh, covalent bonds uh, are between multiple atoms. They are characterized by specific bond angles. And they also have specific bond lengths and bond energies. So uh, we already mentioned covalent bonds. Covalent bonds um, are formed when two atoms share a pair of electrons. They can be single bonds where they're sharing of two electrons, each donated by each participating atom. And uh, this type of bond allows rotation around the bond axis, which is not seen in double bonds and triple bonds. Double bonds are resulting from the sharing of two pairs of electrons. They are more rigid, whereas triple bonds result from the sharing of three pairs of electrons. Three electrons are donated by each atom. It's even more rigid and does not permit free rotation. Interesting uh, property of covalent bonds uh, are uh, some covalent bonds are polar. So when atoms of two different elements form a covalent bond, uh, the, these two atoms uh, attract the shared electrons to different extents. The pair of electrons is shared unequally with a partial transfer between the atoms, and this results in a polar covalent bond. Uh, molecules are held to each other with non-covalent bonds inside cells, and one important bond is the hydrogen bond, which results from an interaction in which uh, an electropositive hydrogen atom is partially shared by two electronegative atoms. This is a directional bond. It is strongest when all the three atoms are in a straight line. And they can be weakened by water because it can form competing hydrogen bonds. Ionic bonds are formed when electrons are transferred from one atom to another. Thus, in the end, each of them has uh, a charge. And uh, Van der Waals interactions are weak interactions. These are interactions or attractions between two neutral atoms at a close range. And it arises uh, from the formation of induced transient dipoles. Uh, and there's a fluctuation in the electron cloud and it produces a transient dipole that uh, can induce an oppositely polarized dipole in a nearby atom. And uh, these are very weak interactions, but they are not weakened by water. And uh, finally, hydrophobic forces are caused by pushing away of nonpolar groups out of the hydrogen bonded water network. These are non-specific, but they are very important for protein folding. 
So water molecule of course is very important in cells um, as I already mentioned. Water has uh, what is a dipole it has got polar covalent bonds and overall it has a net neutral charge but the electrons are asymmetrically distributed. The oxygen nucleus it draws electrons away from hydrogen towards itself and thus imparts a weak positive charge to the hydrogen and there's excess of electron density on the oxygen atom which creates weak uh, negative regions with a tetrahedral symmetry shown here as delta minus. So once again the hydrogen bond it is an interaction uh, between a hydrogen which has got a positive charge that shares a polarized covalent bond with a more uh, electronegative atom such as this oxygen here which is referred to as a donor and uh, with an atom with a partial negative charge which is the acceptor which is a part of another dipole. So uh, due to the polarized nature water molecules can form hydrogen bonds they form such types of hydrogen bonded lattice. Uh, the hydrogen bonds are of course much weaker than covalent bonds uh, and uh, as I already mentioned they would be strongest when the three atoms are in a straight line. Uh, water molecule can bond with four others to form a transient flickering uh, cluster inside the aqueous medium. There are also small organic molecules, the carbon based molecules present within cell. Um, the carbon can form large molecules. Uh, it's a small atom. It has four electrons and four vacancies in its outermost shell and it can form four covalent bonds with other atoms. A carbon can also join to other carbon atoms by very stable covalent carbon-carbon bonds. It can form rings and chains and it can in fact form large molecules with no obvious upper limit to their size. Uh, these carbon-based compounds in cells are referred to as organic molecules and they also have various chemical groups which are reactive and uh, these are common in biological molecules such as hydroxyl, carboxyl, amino, uh, phosphate etc. Examples of these types of organic molecules in cells are sugars, fatty acids, nucleotides, amino acids and uh, uh, we'll take an example of amino acids here which are uh, building blocks for uh, larger macromolecules termed polypeptides or proteins. Shown here are two amino acids. So here's a central carbon. It is bonded to four different groups amino, a hydrogen, carboxylic and a side chain. Now this side chain can vary and based on what the side chain is there are 20 common amino acids in proteins uh, which I mentioned over here and you can sort of recap your biochemistry. Um, it's important to know the structures of some of these amino acids but they are four different groups non-polar polar, acidic and basic and uh, the names are mentioned here in their single letter abbreviations. So um, uh, two amino acids uh, they can actually come together and form a peptide bond by the removal of one water molecule and uh, this forms what we would call is a dipeptide and you can in fact have a chain of such amino acids referred to as a polypeptide which is forming a protein. This process of peptide bond formation uh, is quite complex and it happens uh, within um, a large uh, complex known as the ribosome. So here is the messenger RNA which is transcribed from uh, DNA which stores a genetic material and it is complementary to the gene sequence from which it is derived. And uh, within the ribosome, transfer RNA molecules bring uh, the amino acids and they are hooked up in this chain of polypeptides. So this is where the peptide bond formation occurs. 
So as already mentioned, most of the macromolecules in cells are polymers. Uh, macromolecules in cells are very abundant and their roles range from information, regulatory as well as structural roles. Examples given earlier were polysaccharides, nucleic acids and proteins. Uh, we'll take the example of proteins here. As I already mentioned, they are polymers of amino acids. They are formed via condensation reaction by loss of a water molecule and linkage uh, via a peptide bond, uh, which is a CONH bond, which is somewhat uh, partially uh, planar. Uh, these uh, polypeptides, uh, they can fold into different structures. Uh, common secondary structures are alpha helix formed by hydrogen bonding between uh, amino acids uh, on the same chain and also beta plated sheets are another type of secondary structural element. Uh, they can fold via non-covalent interactions into these precise stable shapes when these shapes are crucial for their functions. So you can also have another level of folding termed uh, the three-dimensional tertiary structure where the secondary uh, structural elements are further organized in three-dimensional space. And different polypeptides can come together and associate with each other again by non-covalent uh, uh, bonds. Different subunits of protein complexes come together in this way. Uh, in addition, uh, different protein complexes can form complexes with other uh, molecules, other macromolecules as well, and uh, form uh, large molecular machines uh, capable of performing complex tasks such as the ribosome that we just mentioned. So in a cell, chemical reactions occur in an aqueous environment in a dynamic network of water molecules which are bound via hydrogen bonds. Uh, the chemical reactions within cells can generate order. Uh, for example, the synthesis of macromolecules and their assembly. And they also release heat. The synthesis requires energy and that comes from oxidation of food and organic molecules. Many different reactions are constantly being performed in a living cell. This is referred to as metabolism. It can be anabolic or biosynthetic where small molecules are used uh, along uh, with energy to synthesize other larger molecules or catabolic that is breakdown of food into small molecules to generate energy which, which are then utilized for biosynthesis. Activated carrier molecules are produced by oxidation of food molecules. These molecules, they store energy um, as a chemical bond energy in the form of energy rich covalent bonds. And uh, this can be used for energy requiring uh, reactions of biosynthesis. Uh, examples of such activated carriers are ATP, adenosine triphosphate, NADH, NADPH, FADH2, acetyl coenzyme A, and various other uh, molecules. Uh, ATP is a common energy currency in cells. ATP hydrolysis is coupled to synthesis of biological polymers. Because ATP is also a building block of nucleic acids. ATP is formed in cells via reactions uh, driven by the energy released during the oxidative breakdown of foods and it is synthesized by this fascinating uh, molecular machine termed ATP synthase which is present in the mitochondria. It's got three uh, phosphate groups. They are linked in a series by two phosphoanhydride bonds and breaking these bonds releases large amounts of useful energy which is used for energy requiring reactions. Uh, the terminal phosphate group of ATP is often split off by hydrolysis sometimes transferring this phosphate to other molecules and uh, releasing useful energy that drives energy requiring biosynthetic reactions. Uh, 
energy release from this hydrolysis occurs because cleavage of this bond it separates off uh, one of uh, the uh, negatively charged uh, phosphates and it relieves some of the electrostatic repulsion in the molecule the standard free energy of hydrolysis uh, uh, of atp has a value of minus 30.5 kilojoules per mole and in fact in cells this value is even more negative because the concentrations of atp adp and pi are lower in cells uh, and uh, in spite of uh, this negative delta G value, ATP is kinetically stable towards non-enzymatic breakdown at uh, pH of 7 because the activation energy for ATP hydrolysis is relatively high. So it doesn't spontaneously occur and this can only occur when it is catalyzed by an enzyme which is referred to as an ATPase. Enzymes are a class of biological catalysts that accelerate reactions within the cells. Enzymes are mostly proteins, although there are RNA catalysts terms, termed as ribozymes also exist in cells. Uh, enzymes bind substrates in such a way that lowers the activation energy of the reaction that needs to occur. They have a much higher affinity for the unstable transition state then for the stable form of the substrate and this uh, binding lowers the energy of the transition state enzymes are highly specific they only uh, catalyze a specific type of reaction using particular substrates so they are not interchangeable uh, coenzymes are small organic molecules that work with enzymes to enhance the reaction rates Coenzymes are recycled to participate in multiple enzymatic reactions. For example, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide or NAD+. It's an electron carrier in oxidation reduction reactions. Uh, this can accept two electrons and a hydrogen ion uh, from one substrate to form NADH that can then donate these two electrons to another substrate reforming NAD+. We have discussed various molecules present inside cells. So is a cell just a bag of chemicals that react? In fact, the molecules inside cells are ordered and highly organized. Cellular processes follow established chemical and physical principles. They are not entirely magical as it might seem. These processes are interconnected and they serve a purpose. Cells can grow and replicate themselves. So a living cell can be defined as a complex chemical system bounded by a membrane that performs complex processes that are purposeful and often interdependent in order to maintain itself and that can grow and reproduce that is make another copy of itself. Thus a cell is a minimal self-replicating unit of living matter. Stay tuned for the next lecture.